Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beyond Decoding Inspection. Uh, here today, we have um, uh, an expert in the industry as invited today, and he's our special guest on the Expert Boy series. And this series will be talking a lot, a lot about microbial corrosion. And the series name will be Corrosion, Microbial Corrosion Explained. And um, please, uh, Dr. Reza, please introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, yes, this is uh, Dr. Reza Jawaharteshti. Uh, I'm a corrosion specialist and I have uh, spent about more than basically more than two decades of my life, my professional life in dealing with corrosion management and particularly micro microbial corrosion. I have authored uh, uh, about eight books published by uh, publishers such as Wiley, uh, Springer, CRC Press, Elsevier and so on. And uh, also I have been involved in more than 400 industrial projects around the world. And in my life, I have seen a lot of cases of uh, uh, microbial corrosion. At the moment, I'm authoring a, a series, but better to say a book that I call as mini pictorial atlas of microbial corrosion cases, where I have collected a lot of uh, case histories, both from industry and academia, uh, that explains where basically we can see microbial corrosion and microbial um, degradation. These are different issues. And uh, also uh, there is a <clears throat> text, uh, a textual part ahead of it that um, I'm basically talking about some aspects of microbial corrosion that so far uh, have not been covered. Uh, the main point there is to give engineers and professionals in industry uh, basically what they need in uh, and most of the time in papers and um, uh, you know, manuscripts published in journals, books, etc. What you see is that they are full of, you know, uh, SEM, uh, you know, images, a lot of... Um, uh, curves, I don't know, uh, too much science into it. But for a, a, a field engineer, what is needed basically is uh, how to recognize the uh, problem correctly, yeah. <clears throat> how to uh, basically treat it in such a way that is uh, both feasible and uh, in a way that it will not repeat itself. And the third is that this problem, we don't want to reoccur again so that uh, we will be spending again and again and again on that uh, so that the asset will come to uh, a state in its life that I'm calling in my publications, I have called it as a uh, Zug effect state. Uh, which is quite a new terminology. Okay, Mr. Teresa, this is a very impressive background you have, and you. and you already mentioned some good important uh, topics about uh, the uh, the importance of awareness on, on corrosion. Yes, because for me, uh, being a master coating inspector and a protective coating specialist, you know, I'm more on the field. And, and I have experience in different projects that sometimes the main concern or the main issue uh, to get projects done the, the right way, the correct way, is because uh, some, some um, participants on the project don't realize or don't recognize um, the importance of corrosion control and corrosion prevention. That's so right. that, that is why Beyond the Coding Inspection uh, was mm -hmm. born, because as, as with you, I have been blessed to know a lot of experts around the world, and, mm -hmm. and I have had very interesting conversations with them that have 
make me learn a lot in the process. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this program and this series are intended to share that information with, with, with the audience and, and reach uh, more people, so more uh, interested people in, in, in this interesting topic can, can become, you know, more aware of the, of the importance of, of corrosion. Yes. So yes. we will be doing a, a series regarding microbial corrosion. So if you can introduce us to the microbial corrosion, like a, a brief introduction so the audience can know more mm-hmm. about what is MIC. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, actually, MIC is... Uh, electrochemical corrosion per se. It means that in order for microbial corrosion to happen, especially in industrial um, environments, you will need three uh, factors working together and joined together properly. First, you must have a metal that is quite vulnerable to lose electron. And this is what we call as an anode then we need uh, a counter electrode that would receive these electrons that we call as the cathode. Um, And then, uh, last but not least, you will need an environment through which ions thus produced could be traveling, that we call as electrolyte. Electrolyte, most of the time, is either water, or water phase of a certain fluid. For example, when we talk about oil and gas, uh, the water cut that these um, substances uh, have basically would act as the electrolyte. Uh, For uh, our uh, uh, listeners who have taken courses in electrochemistry, Uh, they may wonder why I did not mention uh, existence of a metallic metallic path through which electrons can be transferred. When we are talking about industrial uh, cases, uh, of course, metals are there. There is no need to put more emphasis on it. We are not talking about laboratory conditions. All right. Therefore, Uh, corrosion is uh, happening on metals. There are certain living macro and micro organisms that can actually uh, affect corrosion, either by accelerating it or sometimes under certain conditions, they may decelerate uh, corrosion and slow it down. This is a a wrong um, perception that Uh, We assume that whenever we see bacteria in the system, then there is a likelihood for uh, getting um, high rates, uh, a high corrosion rates. Uh, This may not be the case. Just uh, seeing bacteria in the system is not uh, a, a good reason to assume that the case is microbial corrosion. Actually, during my years of, uh, uh, of, of uh, working in several industries around the world, what I have learned is that when you see a case of corrosion that you cannot explain, uh, first, you have to assume that it is not related to bacteria. It is not microbial corrosion. First assumption must be that you try to explain it as if no bacteria, no MIC is involved. When you fail in explaining so, then the second plan will be concentrating on microbial corrosion. There are a lot of bacteria that uh, since, um, particularly since uh, last century, we know that uh, are capable of affecting uh, mechanical uh, mechanical integrity of engineering uh, materials, both metals and non-metals. But for some reasons, it is interesting to see that the only metal that cannot be affected by bacteria 
uh, and lose its mechanical integrity is titanium alloys. Okay. For some reasons, titanium is not being affected. There is uh, there, there are there are uh, research activities going on to find out why, and we do have some theories that explain it. But the point is that uh, bacteria can affect all. Um, engineering materials by some ways or another. Like, for example, we have acid-producing bacteria such as uh, sulfur-oxidizing bacteria, which are capable of creating sulfuric acid with pH 1, which is quite uh, an acid. Um, or we have sulfate-reducing bacteria that they reduce sulfates to sulfites and provided that you have, <clears throat> sorry, you have ferrous ions available, then they uh, basically form what we call as black rust or iron sulfide. And iron sulfide has a very low uh, mechanical uh, stability. And, uh, uh, and uh, I mean, when you compare it with, you know, steel, uh, and therefore the material corrodes. There are a lot of uh, ways by which microorganisms can accelerate corrosion, um, and under some circumstances, as I say, as I said, they are capable of decelerating corrosion, and this is basically what that makes MIC a big puzzle, because you cannot just uh, say that, okay, I have seen some SRB, self-reducing bacteria in my system. Then I should go for elimination of these bacteria because I will get very high corrosion rates. It is quite possible that these bacteria uh, could not have do anything with, with you know, increasing the corrosion rates. Actually, I have done some research in that uh, research. I intentionally uh, introduced uh, very corrosive bacteria into an environment, into an, uh, a controlled environment where the material to which uh, these bacteria were exposed were stainless steel 316L. And uh, although we repeated the experiment several times, we did not get any corrosion. The uh, corrosion started when the amount of dissolved iron in the, in the media became around two parts per million. This gave us the, uh, the clue that if the material you use has a good record of being resistant to microbial corrosion and you have done your corrosion management homework well, Having some bacteria in the environment will not necessarily mean that you have to be alerted about that. It is quite an interesting subject. Microbial corrosion can be seen in many, many industries, from oil and gas uh, to power plants to uh, having affected sheep holes, um, I would say fire water lines in many places you can see the effects of these bacteria. As I said, it is not just bacteria. They have their cousins that we call as archaea. Archaea are also capable of inducing corrosion at higher temperatures. We have algae, which are capable of inducing corrosion, mainly by uh, establishing differential aeration cells. We have fungi that are capable of accelerating corrosion. Some of the fungi are capable of generating acids that would dissolve uh, uh, metals such as aluminum. Therefore, I would say that uh, there are a lot of uh, reactions by which bacteria can actually dissolve metals and non-metals and therefore, you know, uh, bring us a lot of uh, damage and Economical as well, uh, economic as well as ecologic damages. Yeah, I I really appreciate 
uh, that you have the time and the commitment to share with with us and with the audience Thank you. for all this wisdom and and I'm sure that we will be sharing and expanding more on this topic. That was a very, very good introduction. Thank you. And and yes, I I really appreciate that, Mr. Reza. Thank you. Um, on a previous conversation that, that we had, um, it was called to my attention that you mentioned something very, very important because uh, we are trying to bring all this window, uh, wisdom, sorry, and, and and all your knowledge about this, and try to put it on a, um, on a more day-to-day -day basis, like what the people or, or the uh, professionals in this industry uh, face when, yes. when, when they, they are, you know, on, 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 a, on a real project. Yeah. And, and we were talking about the importance of investigation uh, for, the, for the corrosion industry. There is a lot of very good investigations out there And, and I think that uh, investigation is a, a very important component on, on all, the, all, all industries. But uh, you mentioned something very important about that your investigations are, do, are, are done on, um, not, not only in a laboratory or, or, or you know, in a, in a very... A, um, a educational institution, but you you go to the field and you a lot of, of the research that you do uh, is regarding real field experiences. Yes. So yes. so can you tell tell us and, and let know the audience about the importance of this type of investigations? Definitely. Thank you. Uh, actually, when you look at the academic size of uh, MIC research you will see that on average, almost every two days, one paper is being published on this topic. But when you go to industry, you see that there, there could be a lot of uh, cases related to MIC, but they are not being um, uh, taken into consideration or they are being ignored simply because of the, uh, I would say, um, uh, undesirable level of knowledge. I'm not saying lack of knowledge, but that the level of knowledge is far from being ideal. I remember that some years ago, I went to inspect a, a, a plant, um, especially for their uh, water line, uh, I mean, fire water line systems. Uh, that was uh, metallic made up of uh, carbon steel. And in my uh, professional uh, judgment, uh, the conditions in the <clears throat> line was quite, uh, was quite prone to, uh, you know, uh, creating the likelihood of microbial corrosion. I uh, wrote it to the plant manager and the, Uh, the, the response I received was that everything is under control. So far, nothing has happened, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, about one month later, there was a big fire in the plant. And when they tried to uh, basically control the fire, they realized that there was no water left in the line, uh, mainly because of the a severe corrosion in the line that had covered, that had basically corroded away about uh, 85% to 90% of the wall, internal wall of the, of the line. And when I was called to uh, basically look at the case, I found out that there were two types of bacteria involved in accelerating corrosion. One was sulfur-reducing bacteria. Another one was iron-reducing bacteria. Uh, and the treatment of all this problem uh, cost them about $1 million. Wow. And this could have been easily prevented by putting very simple uh, measures in place. Um, this was not uh, first and 
certainly it was not the last time we had mm-hmm. such a problem. I still remember another case where uh, people were, uh, they got this uh, uh, line, this water line, um, sorry, uh, shot down in their cooling system. And uh, when they looked at the uh, corrosion products, they found out just from the color of the of the uh, products and the scales, they just uh, assumed that there was some sulfur-reducing bacterial activity in place, simply because uh, in one layer, the color of the of the product of the sorry scale was black. I was called to investigate the case, um, and then uh, because the line had a history of microbial corrosion by Zudomonas, uh, they were strongly thinking that the case was microbial. I took some uh, um, s- some samples from the black colored <coughs> deposit, and uh, I put some drops of uh, diluted hydrochloric acid on it. If it was sulfur-reducing bacteria, then this black layer uh, had to be iron sulfide. And iron sulfide, when you put hydrochloric acid on it, would react and produce uh, H2S with a characteristic smell. I didn't get any of that rotten egg smell. Mm -hmm. So I... uh, carried out to find out what that material was. The material was magnetite, which in color looks like iron sulfide. So the case was not related to microbes. It was related to poor control, uh, poor uh, administration of oxygen scavengers, you know? So it is important for a consultant to know, uh, I would say, other corrosion processes, not uh, to be trapped by the appearance of the corroded um, acid. In the field, you get that. And mind you, the way microorganisms behave in laboratory uh, is not necessarily the way they behave outside the labs the way you see microorganisms in action when you are on the field would be quite different, could be quite different from uh, what an investigator in the field observes. And actually, this is one of my uh, serious, I would say, uh, criticisms about MIC research, that uh, in many of research papers, you see microbiologists writing the paper. You see many uh, researchers, academic researchers writing the paper. Okay, there are uh, papers written by professional engineers, but the number of such papers must increase because as I said, the knowledge must be created in the lab, but the main point of application must be in the field. That's why the gap between what we have uh, discovered so far in research and what we have been applying in the field to recognize and treat microbial corrosion is still there. It is not narrowing down. It is still there and this will not be closed until engineers and researchers come to terms with each other, so to speak. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Reza. That is very valuable insights you are giving us. Thank you. Being you a professional that has been on the field and on, and on the academic side. So I'm, I'm yes. very aware that uh, what you are sharing comes from a very experienced uh, professional in the industry. Thank you. Um, the other day I, I mentioned, I comment to you that I'm, I'm very related to do a lot of dry docking uh, projects, uh, yes. in for dry docking projects. And we were talking about that there is, um, you know, every, every dry docking project have a lot of involvement 
um, with uh, marine fouling. And, yes, yes. And, and marine fouling uh, have mi microorganisms also involved there. Yes. And I think that um, maybe not, not the full uh, general uh, industry, but some, 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 <clears throat> some people in the industry may think that fouling only affects um, and put some roughness on the on the ship hull, but it actually affects and and produce some some type or affection uh, about the corrosion yes. in, in the in the ship hulls. Yes. So just to give our audience um, a brief on on corrosion um, produced by uh, microorganisms on ship hulls, can oh, you? Let, let us know a little bit of that, and, and we can make this a, um, a special topic or, or our next, uh, yeah. next chapter. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, for sure. Uh, when we talk about biofouling, basically, uh, it happens uh, in a... Um, I mean, first we have to know the mechanism by which biofouling happens in the first place. First, a layer of biofilm has to be formed on the surface, whether the surface is a ship hull or whatever. And this uh, biofilm layer will then act as a glue on which uh, barnacles and other uh, marine uh, organisms would uh, basically attach themselves. Therefore, the, uh, the main idea is to find a way how to uh, get rid of um, biofilms already formed, or even better, not to let biofilms uh, form in the first place. Before I continue more, I would like to uh, draw the attention of you and our colleagues uh, to a uh, to a very interesting matter here. The word, uh, the, the, the terminology, <clears throat> the term biofilm uh, is actually uh, incorrect because it implies that we are talking about a film, a continuous film, which has 100% uh, biological content. Neither is true. Biofilm is not a film per se, mm -hmm. and it does not contain 100% biological material. For this, I uh, published a paper last year, and, <clears throat> and in that paper, I suggested that it's, uh, it makes sense that instead of biofilm, we use another terminology that I borrowed from uh, the, the Greek language, that is temenos. The meaning of temenos is basically cut off. It's something that has been cut off from its surrounding. And this is the way basically biofilms uh, do. Under the biofilm, you could have a lot of uh, parameters such as dissolved oxygen, pH, and the like that could be far different from their counterparts uh, uh, outside the biofilm. That's why I called, uh, I called for uh, professionals to uh, switch from biofilm as a term to temenos. All right, now, when temenos is formed, as I said, it acts like a, like a glue. And if somehow we can make the coating material uh, super hydrophobic in such a way that temenos will not be formed, therefore, no problem with uh, biofouling uh, would be expected to happen, at least in theory. Um, Coatings, when it comes to coatings, as you know it much better than I do, we have to be careful about two factors, 
external factors and internal factors. External factors are those factors that affect the integrity of coating <clears throat> from outside. Um, for example, moisture or, um, uh, I don't know, um, ambient temperature, things like that. Internal factors, the most important of internal factors is the adhesion between coating and the substrate. Uh, if you have the best coating ever made with low adhesion, it means that actually you have done nothing because by time the coating will be deteriorated and some parts of the, of the substrate will be left without coating and these bare uh, uh, sections will act as uh, anodes compared yeah. with the covered areas that can be taken as cathode. Uh, therefore, one point that at the moment our group here uh, are quite concerned uh, about and are, uh, are uh, seriously working on, and actually uh, we have uh, received very, very interesting results, has been to in has been to increase the adhesion in such a way that no matter how harsh the external factors could be, the coating will not lose its adhesion. If you apply super uh, hydrophobic uh, um, coatings on ship holes, therefore, as I said, Temenos will not find uh, an opportunity to be formed. Why? Because the mechanism by which Temenos is formed is that bacteria, which are basically first in their planktonic state, planktonic means freely, uh, uh, freely uh, swimming around. Um, when bacteria cannot find uh, nutrients in bulk, in bulk water, they start to uh, go for it on surfaces. And for that, they produce a film that is called conditioning film. And bacteria start to grow legs and hands, literally speaking, to sit on this conditioning film. Therefore, from planktonic state, they switch to sessile state, motionless state. This is not just something like, you know, changing from freely swimming to motionless state. No, when bacteria uh, start to become sessile and motionless, actually some uh, genetic um, uh, changes start to happen in these bacteria. Therefore, one of, one of these genetic changes is that by time when they increase the thick, their thickness so that uh, temenos is formed, then um, it is possible for them to increase their uh, their growth their growth rate with very small of nutrients. Uh, therefore, if you, for example, just clean a little bit of this uh, uh, biofouling, but uh, fail to do it properly, and you leave just a small part of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, biofouling in place, that a small part will regrow and will cause the problem again. This is what we call as a regrowth. And in order to prevent this, we have some measures in place. One of them, as I said, is modification of the of the substrate. Another one is use of some biocidal uh, material. Um, when we talk about biocidal material, we have to be very careful because in marine environments, uh, when you apply uh, biocide, you have to also be careful that uh, it must not create a chain effect because the toxic material we use to kill the bacteria may enter into the food chain and end up in the fish body. 
which will be consumed by human beings. Therefore, use of biocidal uh, agents uh, has to be very, very restricted and very careful. The best is basically what we recently do, especially in uh, in uh, for for ship for um, ship hulls, is to apply certain coatings, yeah. and then cathodic protection. Cathodic protection cannot always account for everything. Actually, about 20% of deficiencies of coatings can be addressed by, by cathodic protection, not all of it. Therefore, uh, practically speaking, the only measure we have against, uh, uh, against uh, <clears throat> biofouling will be coating and coating quality, as well as, as I said, its properties for increasing its adhesion uh, to onto the substrate. Okay, Dr. Reza, thank you for that uh, additional uh, complete explanation. Um, I think we have had a very enlightening session. Thank I'm you. sure that the audience will be looking up uh, out there more for more uh, of, our, so. of our ch next chapter yes. um, regarding microbial corrosion and we will be as I said before expanding much more and talking about uh, a lot more of this very interesting topic thank you and uh, Dr. Reza um, yes. just before closing out I consider myself a, a big follower a big fan of your work Thank you. And I would like to uh, to you to let let the audience know how if they if they want to dig more to know more about this um, a special topic how can they uh, contact you or how can they uh, look out for your for your work for your paper for your books yeah. um, how can they uh, investigate more about your work? Thank you very much for your. Um warm words. Uh, there are three ways by which uh, my colleagues and friends can reach me. Uh, first, uh, I am very active on LinkedIn. Okay. So if they just uh, um, uh, give me a message on LinkedIn, uh, I will uh, be more than happy to get back to them with an answer, hopefully. The second thing is by... Uh, uh, by uh, my email. Um, I have two emails. One is Yahoo and another one belongs to our company, uh, Eninco. Uh, my Yahoo is actually my surname, which is not that easy to pronounce, javaherdashti at yahoo.com. They can always drop me a line and I will be more than happy to hopefully um, uh, get back to them. Um, another uh, possibility is that at the moment, as I am with Eninco Engineering Beve in the Netherlands, they can just uh, Google uh, the name of the company, Eninco, and uh, leave a message on, 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 um, on the website, or uh, you can uh, just uh, visit www.eninco.com Dot com and there you can easily reach me and uh, pre uh, and uh, ask me your question. I will be more than happy to uh, be with uh, my colleagues uh, either in physical form or you know virtual form. Uh, and I also thank you for giving me this opportunity to be able to talk to a wider audience. Thank you so much. I yeah, appreciate. Please. The pleasure is mine, and I will make sure to to share all your contact information as well with with Thank all you. the audience, and and I'm sure we we will talk in more frequently and and very soon again. Definitely. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank again, you. Dr. Reza, Thank for you. for your time and Thank you, and for all your willingness to to share your your wisdom with us. Thank you so much. Thank you again, and have a lovely day. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Next chapter. Thank you.